dream big never stop dreaming because you can do whatever that you want as long as you believe in your dreams welcome to the first episode of season two of the dare to dream productions podcast I'm very excited for today's podcast because our guest has played numerous film festivals, including Oscar qualifying festivals, Holly Shorts, and Athens International. Her drama short, Olander, explores female sexuality and identity through a strong female protagonist who has agency and is proud of who she is, something we don't see much in films and TV shows. She plans on having Olander serve as a proof of concept for her feature. Please welcome director and editor Kate Hackett. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. So let's start from the beginning. How did you get into filmmaking and editing? So I grew up in a really creative family. Um, My father and mother are both theater directors. um, So I grew up uh, going backstage with them and I, we had a lot of friends who were actors. So I always, just had that around me, acting and performance. And also my um, great grandmother was a a painter, a California plein air painter. And she um, grew up with a lot of the people who became Disney's original, uh, or sorry, became a painter with a lot of the the people who became Disney's original uh, painters. And my my grandmother was a um, Martha Graham dancer, um, a student of hers. So I just grew up kind of surrounded by creativity and always thought I would go into a creative field. Um, And I think when I started to know that I wanted to do film was uh, when I was in college, I was directing a play and I just felt like I wanted to zoom in on details of the play. Like I just wanted to see the hands of the um, of the protagonists instead of like their whole body or, or I just wanted a close up of their faces. And, and I felt restricted by the format of the play to a certain extent that I couldn't sort of guide the viewer's eyes in that way. Um, I started realizing that was probably film that would allow me to do that. And um, in terms of editing, so I went to film school at UCLA for my MFA and um, I was in the production directing program and I was um, editing my thesis film and I just realized that I I hired um, an editor, but I started realizing that I really wanted to get in there myself and edit it. And I actually solved a lot of problems with my thesis film that happened in the field. I solved them in post. Um, And I started learning the magic of post and what you can do not only with editing, but with sound design and your mix and um, the score and all those kinds of things. So I, um, I started realizing that editing might be something as well as pursuing a directing career that I might want to do concurrently. Um, and then I had a wonderful editing professor um, His name is Curtis Clayton. He's an editor, a fantastic editor. And and he connected me with my first ultra low budget feature film as an editor, which um, was a film called Homecoming. It's about, it was shot on a DSLR um, and it was about a a, a female medic coming home from the war in Afghanistan. And she um, has two very unmotivated friends from high school who, she sort of needs to um, motivate to get off the sofa and learn to find some meaning in in life. So it's it's a friend dramedy um, sort of set in the backdrop of of the war as well. So um, that was my first feature that I cut and I kind of fell in love with editing since then. Very cool. And you've been doing a lot in terms of editing, like a lot of features and also shorts, right? Yes, yeah, I have. Um, I've recently, so most recently as an editor, I've been primarily in the um, in the uh, documentary sphere for the past few years. Um, so I cut the documentary, se- I was an editor on the documentary series uh, Cheer and Last Chance You for Netflix. Um, and I also uh, recent, or in recent history, um, edited a uh, feature documentary called half the picture about female directors in Hollywood. 
um, and I'm currently working on a doc. So, um, but I have also cut and love cutting scripted work, um, and I've done that as well in in my career, and and would like to do more of it. So I'm I'm in both sides of that equation. Very cool. So you said you went to film school, and you went. Did you go to undergrad too, or did you just? go straight well you have to go to undergrad sorry so where did you go to undergrad so I went to undergrad at the University of St Andrews in Scotland um and uh at the time it was um it was uh very financially accessible for an American to go there perhaps more than um more more than many good universities in the in the states so um that was partially my motivator, um, but also to have the experience to go abroad. And um, I studied uh, English, or sorry, Spanish and uh, art history um, as my major. So uh, they didn't have a, a film major there. And I also wanted, I knew that I wanted to have a like a broader horizon to a broader liberal arts background. So. I'm really grateful that I was a Spanish major because I feel like that has broadened my horizons to, you know, uh, film from other countries, um, you know, uh, being able to easily sort of like have knowledge of the film industry in Spanish speaking countries and what what it's like there. So um, not to mention, you know, working on projects in LA, you know, at times that are um, bilingual. Um, so that that's been like a sort of really wonderful offshoot of just getting like your standard liberal arts uh, education before going into film school. Do you advise going to film school? You know, that's so, it's such a hard and personal question. I feel like for me, I, I, I also think times have really changed since I graduated from film school in 09. And I think this whole movement that we've seen with this sort of awareness on a larger scale in the larger media of women in film and the issues that um, women filmmakers can face has really happened after I graduated. So when I went to film school, I didn't see many people like me represented in the film industry. And I felt like I just wanted to be as confident as possible and to emerge with as many tools as possible before I entered the industry. Um, like I sort of wanted to arm myself. Um, and so for me, I think that was really valuable because I did emerge with a lot of creative confidence and was able to kind of find myself artistically in film school. Um, I think, you know, so that's the plus side. The other plus side is like on a level of you know, my colleagues in film school are still my friends and my colleagues and my collaborators. So that was huge. Um, in, you know, the, the downside is very large, which is it's like a significant financial um, burden. <laughs> and it's, um, and that's not to be sneezed at. Um, and I think um, that's why I wouldn't advise anybody to go <laughs> because I would say, I would never want to advise them to go or not to go because I would say that taking on that burden is significant and there are many ways that you can enter the film industry that don't involve going to film school as well. Yeah, that's definitely good advice because it does cost a lot of money. Yes, and more so, I mean, really since I went to UCLA in in state and um, at the end all of you know, the prices for everything has just raised so much since I went for, for not only for that school, but for so many schools. So sexuality in women is such a taboo topic for many people, let alone sexuality in high school women. What was your inspiration for such a progressive depiction of a high schooler that we normally do not get to see? Um, yeah, well, so Oleander is a short about a teenage girl who's rebelling against a Christian abstinence program. Um, and we see the, the push and pull and kind of battle of wills 
between her and um, the head of the program, who's this very poised, charismatic woman, and also um, with a filmmaker who's, um, who's uh, documenting this process. The, the inspiration for me came from, I was raised uh, going to Catholic schools in, in middle school, not in high school, and I would really have, um, I, I would, I took away a lot of wonderful things from my Catholic education, like a certain, I think there's a certain humanitarian um, quality and interest in other people um, and, and like what makes them tick in my work that is a lot of part of that education. But one thing that was quite difficult for me with that from the Catholic education is I, for me, I internalized a lot of shame related to sexuality. Um, and, um, and that, that really followed me in my life in ways that were destructive. And, um, when I was younger, um, even in, uh, you know, as a preteen, you know, I would like argue with the teachers on these issues and engage sort of intellectually, um, about issues related to like, you know, women's autonomy over their own bodies. And, and so I was like very, um, I was very intellectually engaged in that way as a teen, even though I didn't maybe even understand everything I was talking about yet. And so I wanted to see something that respected a teenage girl's intellect related to these issues of, of sexuality and her autonomy over her own body. Because I'd seen films where, where teenage girls are like discovering themselves and they don't know, but I hadn't seen, which are like fantastic films, you know, but I hadn't seen a film where like a young woman was very um, sort of sure of her worldview and what she believed was right. And, um, you know, she may not have everything worked out yet and it may be some bravado that she's very sure, but she is like, an intellectual force to be reckoned with. And I think sometimes in our culture, the way we sort of like diminish the agency and brain power of, um, of teenage girls can also lead us to not respect that they should be involved in these choices that involve their own bodies. Definitely. So your goal is to have it serve as a proof of concept. For those who do not know what that is, can you explain it and talk about the value of it? Sure, yeah. So I wrote a feature film screenplay um, for Oleander. It's called Purify My Heart. And it actually did really well on sort of the contest circuit. And it was an um, American zoetrope finalist and a um, nickel quarter finalist. and. Um, and uh, so I, I want to get this film produced. I want to direct it. And um, I've, I created this film to show the vision and the characters and the world of my film and to, to kind of show a little slice um, of what a larger piece could look like. Um, I also wanted it to stand alone dramatically so that you can see it and not know that it's connected to a larger piece and it's totally satisfying. So it was really important to me that it work in both of those ways. Um, but now the idea is to find the right producer to come on board and help turn it into a fully realized uh, feature film as well. Very exciting. Have you had any luck at festivals with that? Because like, at least in film school, they're teaching us that when you have like these proof of concepts to bring it to like network it at the festivals and see if anyone's interested. I think, you know, what's been so challenging with um, this round of festivals, unfortunately, is they just haven't been in person. And I feel like so much of that networking has, uh, you know, happens in person at the, at the, at the festivals. So I think it'll probably be a process of going through this festival process and then, you know, reaching 
reaching out to people um, in, uh, you know, in my network, but you never know. I, I think there are some festivals that are building like virtual networking opportunities and it could be that, that um, something arises from one of those. So why did you want to tell this story now? Why is it relevant to today? You know, I think it's interesting because I started, I started writing the screenplay for the feature screenplay. That's what I wrote first. And I started writing that um, in uh, like 2015. So it's been an idea that has stayed with me for a while. And I started um, writing it, you know, I st the idea came to me in the Obama era. So I, I was writing more about like, um, uh, issues that I had faced in, in my own life. And I think um, I, I was writing about my own, exploring my own thoughts related to how we treat female sexuality in our culture, how we use um, the media um, as uh, within our institutions, um, like, you know, be they politics or religion as a form of control and power. I was interested in all of those things um, already. And I think especially me, myself being a media maker and an editor, I was really interested in um, media and ethics related to media. But, um, you know, then like when, you know, the Trump era came in um, and so many things changed, I think for all of us, in terms of our national discourse, it just felt like a lot of the themes in my um, film that I'd been writing about were sort of exploding everywhere. Um, so, um, and uh, I and you know specifically, I think this issue of um, uh, abstinence-only sex education, um, which the film highlights and and um, sort of shows some of the flaws in. Um, has really become a policy issue in our country. Um, just when I talk to sex educators, they talk about this. And I've talked to a lot of sex educators um, who found me after they saw the film and, and, and were like, you know, felt that the film was addressing things that they wanted to talk about. Um, and um, uh, abstinence only, sex education programs are extremely common in our country and um, they receive federal funding. Um, and so, uh, you know, it wasn't actually until, funnily enough, until after I made the film and people reached out to me and said like, look, this is a, a, a you know, a really important issue that I realized there's this um, very direct policy um, uh, concern, you know, related to abstinence-only sex education as well, because uh, students who only receive abstinence-only sex education, um, you know, are less educated about STDs, they're less educated about risks with um, pregnancy, um, they're less educated about uh, consent, issues of consent, and they're less educated about LGBTQ sexuality. So, um, and, and I think that's just a short list. So I, you know, I think uh, it's funny because I wasn't thinking of the film politically, I was thinking of it personally, but now that I've engaged with um, many people about the film, I, I'm starting to think of it more politically as well. As soon as the film starts, we hear the protagonist Olander's voice and the style of the film becomes this coming of age story. Why did you choose to tell the story with voiceovers and from a first person point of view? I think, you know, it's funny because I feel like in film school, like one of the first things they'll tell you is don't use voiceover. Um, <laughs> <laughs> get it out, you don't need it, say it with pictures. Um, but I think, uh, you know, for me, I think my whole idea was about, I love the idea that this character Oleander is like an extremely direct from the heart person with like a manifesto on life. And, um, and she's a YouTuber. So she uh, is talking all the time. And, um, and uh, since it's a short, you know, you really only have like shorthand to set up 
that she is this person with a manifesto, that she's a YouTuber. And, and um, I really wanted to, like, I wasn't so interested in subtlety in that arena with her character. Instead, I just wanted to, like, come right out and have her say, this is what I'm about. And, um, and I think that was part of what I was mentioning earlier with like wanting to show the sort of intellectual agency of a teenage girl. Um, and, uh, and you see so many movies where I think it's like, we're the observer of that person. Um, and sort of, we have a lot as the viewer, we have a lot of agency as the viewer to interpret who they are, but I wanted her to be like, this is who I am, deal with it. <laughs> and so that, that was kind of the idea behind it. Awesome. Yeah. I love that about it because like, it did show how she is like this powerful character and she knows what she wants. And I know they teach that in film school, but I think if you're using it properly and to like that character development, then it's not a, a problem. Yeah. One of the movies I always think about is um, Sunset Boulevard because like in that film, the, um, you know, you have the dramatic action, which is like somewhat melodramatic um, you, because there's like, or gothic because like there's an old house and there's like this old lady that lives in the house and she's weird and all this stuff. And, and um, but then you have uh, this like funny, witty, super ironic guy with dark humor making kind of like a meta commentary on everything that's happening. And so the voiceover totally changes like it's so beautiful to have that one tone of like this gothic melodrama and then this other tone of this irony. And um, so, yeah, whenever I hear people say that voiceover is like not okay, I think of that movie because it completely adds another layer that visuals could never add. So the film is set in Bakersfield, California, and we get a glimpse into what it's known for, the neon signs and the country singers. Do you have a personal connection to Bakersfield or why set it there? I do. I, um, my great grandmother was from Bakersfield. Um, she passed away when I was 23 and I was really close to her. And, um, and my grandmother, her daughter lives in Bakersfield still. And I spent all my summers, um, there when, when I was a kid. So, um, and I think, uh, so it's just, it's sort of where my heart is, um, you know, as a, as a, um, as a, as a person, you know, it's like where my, it feels like my home in certain ways. And, and I think, um, what I love, I think I, I really romanticize that place and it really, it, it's the world of, um, you know, it's a, it's a city that, um, has a lot of, uh, agri it's an agricultural hub. Uh, and it's also a city and it um, is the world of like truck stops and neon and diners and um, you know um, uh, this very sort of like Americana um, uh, setting that's very tied to the land very tied to agriculture and and um, I the full feature is set there and and I'm dying to set something there because it's a it's a beautiful place to shoot I think a, some another film I know has been shot in that area was um, a girl who walks home alone at, at night. I think was um, uh, uh, like right in that that area, and and um, you know I think she used that landscape, the sort of unusual quality of that landscape um, in a really beautiful way. That's a great film. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Can you talk about the importance of choosing the right locations in filmmaking and how to do so? Yeah, I, I've i always felt like locations can really um, up your budget for really cheap. <laughs> like that's sort of just pragmatically as somebody who also produces my own film. My thesis film in film school was a period piece. And, you know, so many period pieces that are like, student films can look really bad with the period details. Um, and one of the things that I decided to do was just be incredibly exact with the location. So um, I went to, uh, um, I, it was, so it was set in the 19th century. 
um, in California. And I actually asked several house museums in LA. Um, one was like the Leonis Adobe um, in Calabasas and they had like a museum interior um, that, uh, that was like dressed like a 19th century room. And um, I asked them, you know, I put together a proposal and said, could I shoot here and would you support the project as like, um, uh, you know, with, with your name in the credits and, you know, um, and uh, they, uh, they did. And so, you know, suddenly I was shooting in a 19th century room like a real one, which if you had, if I had had to pay for that, it would have been, you know, like to build that, it would have like, with the resources I had, it would have never looked good. So, um, and I sort of did that with that whole um, film. I also uh, shot in sort of like um, in the, um, uh, the residential quarters of Mission San Miguel um, uh, up in the central coast. And so there's like, a part of it that like doesn't it, it looks like um sort of adobe style but it's like it also looks residential so it it looked like and so it was the same thing where um you know i was able to i just think if you're strategic about locations it can make everything look so much um better you know and in this film again i knew i had limited resources but i also knew sort of like having my um, you know, actors like run down the street in Bakersfield with like these really cool signs behind them would, you know, add a lot of texture and flavor to the film um, that, uh, you know, is hard, is hard to come by on a small budget. Social media, specifically YouTube, plays a large role in the film. Can you talk a little bit about the message you were trying to get across to the audience? Yeah, I think I think I was really interested in the power of media, both for good and for ill, um, for defining your own voice and also the pitfalls and dangers um, th that you can fall into. Um, and um, so I think, you know, my main character is somebody who has um, very thoughtfully defined her voice on social media. Um, but because she's still young, she's not able to completely modulate it or protect herself from having it, it from having her voice taken away from her. Um, and so, so yeah, I think as somebody who works in, in media um, and works as an editor, I really see how easily media can be manipulated. And I see how much manipulated media we have surrounding ourselves on a, on a daily basis. Um, I'm very aware of it. And, um, and so um, I'm concerned with what happens when an institution is able to manipulate media. And so that's one of the things I wanted to talk about, you know, in this film, you know, what happens when a religious institution that has very specific values about how people should behave and how they should use their bodies um, also has um, enough savvy with the media to be able to manipulate somebody else's message. Mm -hmm. I think that's really relevant to the, today, like with just TikTok and Instagram and just like those, you know, fake news even, just like the brainwashing that media can do. But again, there is like this better side. It's it's a tool, right? It's social media should be a tool to, I don't know, it, it depends on what you're going to use it for, but it shouldn't be like your life. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's such a powerful tool. I think it's, I mean, it's kind of like driving a car and you're driving this, like, you're driving a weapon that could also kill somebody or kill you, but it gets you places. Um, and I think it's, uh, I mean, that sounds really extreme, but I think it's, um, I do think there's things that make social media really dangerous if you're not educated about what you're looking at and i don't think we're all educated about it um and i also think that like younger minds like teenage minds are are 
just um, are like literally engineered to be not as risk averse as an older mind or to like understand um, understand all of the um, uh, the the risks. I think we have this idea that like everybody now is sort of like um, born into the world understanding um, media and um, culture and how culture is expressed in the media. But I, I really think it is a learning curve. And I think the hard part of the learning curve sometimes happens in the teenage years. Many male-centric films focus on pinning women against other women. However, in your short, there is rampant evidence of the oppressive structures of the church. What was your reasoning behind making the antagonist a woman as well, or rather two women considering the ending? In the feature version of the film, it's actually, um, it's an ensemble with four people. There's a, also a male, male character who's um, a former pastor who's really trying to figure out his own issues with his own sexuality and having um, a lot of sort of difficulties and, and strife um, that he takes out on other people. Um, and, uh, uh, but I chose to make the short just with the three female characters. And, um, you know, I think the reason I chose to do that is I feel like there have been a lot of films, like you said, that pit women against one another and sort of suggest that women sort of inherently are competitive or, um, uh, you know, but I think I was much more interested in like, what does a patriarchal system do to everybody the, to the women that occupy it. Um, and I don't think it's simply like that the patriarchal system is the perpetrator and, and you know, women are victims. I think also women can gain power within the patriarchal system. And I think as a woman, so you have one woman who, um, uh, you know, this abstinence age educator who I think truly genuinely believes that controlling a system that controls young women um is uh keeping them safe um and i think she i think she genuinely believes that and and i think it's sincere and i think um and i think there are people um there are many people that feel that way um and and i think it's um i i think it does come from cultural uh notions um that that relate to a fear of female sexuality but i think women can very much adopt that too then you have another character this filmmaker who's had to work within a very male dominated film industry and has had to take all sorts of jobs that may not align with her her worldview or her perspective but in order to work she has to take those jobs and and i certainly as a filmmaker um as an editor i try to turn them down I do turn them down, but I've been offered so many jobs that that don't align with my um, sort of feminist views. And I've been, um, you know, I could see that if I just needed to make money, I, you know, I wouldn't maybe always have the luxury to turn those things down. And so you become a part of the patriarchal system or you, you become a media maker as part of that system without even wanting to. It's because you have to eat. So... So I'm really interested, like, I think as a woman, I'm so interested in not just women as, um, you know, how, how women are victimized by society, but I'm also interested, like, how do women fit into a society that isn't cut out for women? And it isn't always by, like, being an angel that we that we find our ways to fit in um and so yeah i think um you know i've been i've loved films like the the um stock market film um equity recently or the the traders film that was with three women that were um like extremely competitive and and i feel like um like i'm totally okay with the pitting women against women genre if it's like showing how women have to navigate a system that's that's corrupt the ending was quite the twist and left an everlasting emotional impact on me on me what message or intention do you want to leave with for audience members i think the ending is um really about um for me you know i i wanted to 
um, have a film where it's like a downer, but <laughs> I wanted to have a film where someone starts with a voice that's very present and ends up having a voice that that gets taken away. And I think that's what happens um, in a in a system that um, stigmatizes and shames um, young women for sexuality, makes them feel that their sexuality is is shameful, um, uh, that they're that their physicality is shameful. I think it that removes and erases a voice. Um, so I think that was my, um, my, uh, you know, I wanted to have sort of a very shocking ending where a voice was just suddenly removed and where the protagonist is like not even there and um, and not even like part of the story now. And it doesn't even, you know, everything she said doesn't matter and. Um, the feature version um, uh, sort of like is much more um, optimistic for her at the end and it allows her to um, uh, sort of have the last word of the film and, and we end in a place where we feel that she'll be well. Um, but for the short, I, I wanted to leave it in, in that uncomfortable place. So congrats on all the official selections and wins from film festivals. What is some advice you'd give for folks that are going to enter festivals? Um, yeah, that's so, I feel like that's so hard because I, um, it was like a long time for me to sort of like learn about the film festival process and understand how it worked. But, you know, I think one of the things you hear people say is like, with festivals is um, length and to, you know, keep an eye on the length of your film and and make sure that it's a length that festivals tend to program. And and um, I don't know, it sounds so simple, but I, I do think having a shorter film made it more programmable. It's 14 minutes and um, and I've had longer films in the past that, that I think were good, but just like we're 25 minutes, which is a very hard length to program um, into a shorts program. So, you know, I would say that. I would also say like, you know, being um, resilient with the festival rejections and also targeting festivals that like have a meaning to you. Um, uh, you know, I, there are festivals where that I have had my film play in where I just think their programming is beautiful. The San Jose Shorts Fest, um, they have such a great program, Athena Film Festival, I, you know, and there's more than I can, you know, mention, but, but um, you know, I think it's not just about like getting that laurel, it's also about looking at the ethos and the creative vision of the programmers and saying like, what kind of group would I love to be a part of? And and I think like you'll actually find that sometimes the the groups that you're most attracted to are also the ones that select your film because there's a there's a common worldview and um and uh approach and there's some like symbiosis with with how you look at art and you know um so so yeah I think it's that it's not just looking at festivals as like that stamp of a laurel and like another win it's like looking at it as like who are the people i would like to get to know you know as my film goes on a journey so what have you been working on right now and what's your favorite project you're working on i am um so right now i'm working on a feature documentary um and i can't talk about it um totally but it's it's uh it's really archival heavy which um is super fun a lot of the archival is um performance footage from the 70s to the 90s um or 90s early thousands and and so that's just been sort of like a a dream come true coming off of um uh cutting um uh, like very um, verite style documentary filmmaking, like Cheer and Last Chance You, which I love editing like that. It's so much fun, but it's also really fun to um, to uh, like get lost in a world of really fun archival footage. Um, 
And that's, that kind of feels, it appeals to the side of me that like loved detective books when I was a kid. Cause I feel like you're always with archival. It's like, you're always finding something new. Like, oh my gosh, we found this piece. Like, oh, we didn't know this. And, and you'll find, you know, you find these gems like later on, like I saw a film at Sundance where they had this um, incredible moment in the film, a documentary film. Um, and uh, the, in the Q and A afterwards, um, the filmmaker said, uh, you know, that that piece of archival was when they found towards the end of the process. And you can't imagine the film without that piece of archival. So I love that process. Um, and I'm also working on getting the feature film version of Oleander out in the world. You know, that's a big project. And um, I think their features are really cool. And um, it, 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 um, it takes, sort of this world of this abstinence program. And you have this one young woman who's um, uh, very sex positive and, and um, interested in sexuality. And she enters that world and she shatters the world one by one in sort of this, um, you know, in sort of this situation where like this culture of this place gets a pot with a lid on it and it just gets more tenser and tenser and tenser until things break apart. So I'm, I'm excited about like I'm really hopeful about getting to um uh you know expand the world very exciting yeah you'll have to update us if like once it gets in and you find a producer you'll have to come on again and share like what it's like to make the feature I would love to cool go check out her short Orle Oleander and it's available on Vimeo and yeah, I'm very excited for to see what you ha have in the future. And I know you have a very bright path in front of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. <laughs>